Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to our BACBC online services this morning. And uh, if you're here for the very first time, we would be honored to get to know you. Please click on that QR code or go to our website. There's a, a digital welcome information form that we can, where we can get to know you a little bit better. We also um, want to welcome all the youth who are with us this second hour. And you may not have known a church, but we had our first virtual Camp Liftle this uh, past few days. 70 youth and plus their sponsors and helpers were there. And there are some who were not able to make youth that were not able to make Camp Liftle, and so they're joining with us today. So we want to welcome all those in house with us. Our church is about reaching people and growing them into passionate followers of Jesus Christ. I have a few announcements related to that. One is that uh, Jesus uh, commanded those who are his followers as a first step is to uh, publicly declare that you follow him through believer's baptism. So we'll be having some classes in early September and um, preparing for a baptismal service at the end of September. If you're interested, please contact Amelia or info. Uh, we also want to let members know that we'll be having our first ever virtual annual business meeting next Sunday at 1115. And it is essential that we have your updated email address. And so if you did not receive our town hall invite, please check your spam folder, or perhaps you need to update us with your latest email by sending that to info at BACBC.org. This is essential for us to get your, your latest email because we're gonna send you an invite to the annual business meeting, and we'll also be sending you an e-ballot. And so it is important, even if, let's say you're a family that has two adults and a young adult that are members of the church, that we get all three of your unique email addresses so you can vote through the e-ballot. Um, and if you don't have access to email, you can re request a business meeting packet by, by um, mailing the church or phone calling the church office, and we will be glad to send that to you. And if you are going to join the annual business meeting and use your phone, uh, which is that, is that is capable through Zoom, we need to know what that is also because we'll only be allowing those phone numbers that have registered. All right. So um, just as a, so that you're aware, we'll be having our English services. will continue to be combined, English uh, adults and house, through next Sunday. And next Sunday, we'll be having communion, one service, 9.30 a.m., then 11.15, the annual business meeting. Then we're going to have a short series in Philemon, and I'll be uh, speaking on those. We are, as followers of Jesus Christ, obeying his ordinances. One was baptism. We spoke about the second is communion. So we want you to be ready for next week's communion service. Uh, in your hearts, as well as the elements, the bread, and the cup. And now we continue worshiping in our tithes and offerings. You know, even though we are shelter in place and not able to meet in-person worship services, God's work continues at BACBC. We recently had a wonderful VBS where the community was invited and came, several professions of faith, we just fin we're finishing up Camp Liftle among our youth, small groups, Sunday school, worship services. They all help them mature beginning August 23rd to care for those who have lost loved ones. And so we invite you to join us in participating at BACBC's ministries that are spreading the gospel and helping people grow spiritually uh, through uh, offerings this morning. And so please join me in a word of prayer at this time. Our Father, we want to thank you this morning that we could gather virtually to worship you in spirit and in truth. I want to thank you for the youth that are with, with, with us. We're so grateful for them and how they are growing in you. We pray you blessed as Camp Liftle is about to wrap up. And as we think about VBS, Camp Liftle, small groups, worship services, fellowships, uh, uh, grief, grief share ministries. Your work is continuing here, and I pray that you'd help everyone who's listening today recognize the importance of your work continuing, and that everything that we have belongs to you. 
and that we want to give cheerfully and with a generously to advance the gospel uh, through this ministry. Thank you so much for each offering that's being received at this moment. May you use it to multiply your work for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Before we get started in singing, I'd like to share a little bit of what's been on my heart. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Behold, I'm doing something new, and now that it springs forth, do you not see it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Guys, God can lead us into the wilderness to awaken us. And as a mother, I understand a little bit of the process of pain to reap a reward. And I wasn't surprised by this pain and I knew it was part of the plan. And as Christians, we too can be awakened in the wilderness, knowing that God is in control and that sometimes pain is part of his plan. You know, I attended a women's who, a Women Who Worship webinar um, just recently, and I was reminded that God, he reveals himself to us in his goodness and in his teaching. And he is in control in the harvest and in the planting. And today we come before God, and maybe some of you guys are coming off a road filled with highs and lows, feeling far from God, feeling tired and weary and missing the connection with each other, you know, not connecting with God the same way or with your friends the same way. Church, this is our opportunity to worship God in the quiet, in that secret place. We are all created to worship. And even though I'm missing connecting with you and being in a physical sanctuary, you know, maybe you guys miss the stage and the mood lighting, but you know, we are still called to worship. And this is our opportunity to come back to have a heart of worship and make it about Jesus. And I desire to trust the creator like the rest of creation because I've never seen a bird stop singing or eating just because somewhere in the world there was an epidemic of the bird flu. And I've never seen a tree tremble or fall in anticipation of a drought. And as God's people, living in a time where there's a global pandemic and a society filled with people who just fall short, we are first and still called to be Christ followers. And I'll be the first one to admit that in this season, I have spent more time planning and working and worrying about COVID-19 than I have seeking the face of God and trying to find ways to uplift my brother and sisters in Christ. But God is deserving and he is jealous for us and he loves us and he showed that love on the cross. And even if 2020 continues to be a season of pruning and planting, God loves us and he is in control. He is not surprised by any of this. And, you know, if we never see another blessing, God loved us, he loves us, and he will love us. And church, let us be who we were intended to be and stop, come before the Lord, and worship him for who he is and not how we feel this morning. Holy Spirit, turn our eyes and our hearts back to him. Amen? We invite you and we encourage you to join us in this time of worshiping God through song.
are so amazing choir to to do such a wonderful special music piece for us today fairest lord jesus we're we're so blessed by the ministry of the choir that they could lead us in song even as they cannot sing uh in our facility um like we used to as we've done before but thanks be to god that they are still able to minister to us Welcome to BACBC again. My name is Alex, and as one of the English pastors here, we warmly welcome you uh, in Jesus' name. And uh, if you have not been with us recently, um, we have been in a series, a sermon series in the book of Job. And today and next week, we're going to spend our time in Job chapter 3, looking at the silent sufferer, Job. And today we will look at uh, the voice of his lament. So please uh, follow along in your Bible and scroll down to Job chapter 3. This morning I will be uh, reading beginning in verse 1 all the way through verse 12. Let's listen to the, the word of Christ. Verse 1, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born and the night that said a man is conceived. Let, the day, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep, deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those who curse it, who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide the trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Come out from the womb and expire? Why did the knees conceive me or why the breast that I should nurse? This is the word of the Lord. Let us go before our God in prayer right now. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word that is before us today. And God, we recognize that in a difficult time of year, in a difficult year, God, we ask that you would speak to us. This morning, Lord, I ask that you would use these words of Job to teach us afresh something new of the character of God, who you are, and the kind of followers of Christ that we should be. I pray that this morning we would heed your voice through the words of Job's lament. God, may you speak through me, through my feeble words, through my brokenness, Lord. May you shine forth and show yourself to be glorious. And may we pay attention to you, God. Speak to us, Lord. We are desperate for you. We eagerly expect you to do great things in our midst today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we begin to look at the silent sufferer and the voice of Job's lament, this morning I wonder what is your favorite passage of Scripture? Maybe a passage that you yourself have memorized and one that you recite through 
hard seasons. Maybe a a passage of scripture that you would uh, write on a sticky note and put it upon your car or um, get it framed and mounted because it's something that you could always turn to as a rock on which you would stand. For me, I have a verse from Isaiah chapter 26, verse 8, which says, Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your truth, we wait eagerly for you, for your name and your renown are the desires of our souls. It's a favorite verse of mine growing up through college. It was a, a, a very important verse for my spiritual upbringing, and I was so blessed when some church members from our congregation blessed me with a, a framed version of that verse. It was beautiful, and I'm so thankful for you. And yet I wonder for you, as we consider Job chapter 3, what's your favorite verse? What's your passage that you memorize and recite? Would it be Job chapter 3 here as something that you would go back to and remember and get you through hard times? For most of us, maybe not so much Job chapter 3. Because Job here is quite discouraged, and he is lamenting the day that he was born, the day that to him should not be on the calendar anymore. Because he has experienced great loss, he has gone through great suffering through chapter 1, he has lost his children. Um, There in chapter 1, it says that he had seven sons, and three daughters at the beginning of the book. Ten children. Amazing. Amazingly blessed. He had 11,000 cattle, many servants. He was known as a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Verse 8. And yet in the second half of chapter 1, we discover that great calamity is allowed by God to come upon Job, and so he loses just about everything. He loses his livestock, which was his livelihood. He loses his children, and they pass away because of a massive storm. Maybe you could consider a tornado. And yet even as he has experienced such great loss in chapter 1, He was able to to worship God by this act of tearing his robe, shaving his head, and fell on the ground and could sing this song that most of us have been singing so much recently. Blessed be the name of the Lord, even though the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And so Job has experienced great loss, He spent some seven days in silence, right? After after his wife uh, told him, you know, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. And then he spends some seven days in silence with those three friends of his at the end of chapter two. And maybe in the silence, maybe he was even considering the words of his his wife. But after that time has passed, he comes forth and speaks. It is a dark night of the soul. No passage darker than this one in all of the Old Testament, maybe not even in all of Scripture, and only darker could be said of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26. And this morning, I want to commend us, dear brothers and sisters, young and old, all of us. We need to listen to the voice of Job. We need to be careful when somebody has experienced deep grief, and we could easily say, you know, time heals all wounds. And yet, if you have experienced any loss recently, you may have desired to respond, yes, but I am still waiting. 
And it might be good to check up on that friend again after a few weeks. Job here, he, is, he has experienced the initial trauma, that loss, and it was so hard on him. Yet time has passed, at least seven days, and now we are witnessing in these words, Job, in his battle for faith. Have you lost much recently and you are grieving and you have been in anguish and you have now been fighting for faith maybe in a similar way that that job is fighting for his faith in the god that he worships he's looking for struggling for help for today to get him through his his aches and physical pains those sores and he's wrestling for hope for tomorrow Notice his words, he wishes he would be a stillborn child in verse 16, because for a stillborn child, there would be no more trouble, and there would be rest. Do you sense his desire for immediate peace? In verse 20, it speaks of his misery, how he's bitter in the soul. Verse 24 would speak of him sighing and groaning. And then in verse 25, it seems as if Job might have some insight into the thing that he experienced, this disaster, and it is as if he somehow had a clue, an inkling of what would happen to him later. And he says, for the thing that I fear comes upon me, verse 25, and what I dread befalls me. This kind of reminds me of my youngest daughter, AJ, and some of his, her, her, ex, her experiences recently in the sense that she's been waking up in the middle of the night, banging on me and Vivian's door. So she bursts in after I, I, I open the door after a few minutes of her banging. And I wonder, what's going on? Why does she keep on waking up every night? During this whole whole pandemic, she's been waking up in the middle of the night. This is, of course, after me laying on the floor trying to uh, get her to fall asleep initially. I I, I just lay there holding her hand right through her bed. It takes her some half an hour plus to fall asleep. And a couple hours later, she wakes up again. And so when I open the door after she bursts in, I hold her, I have to give her a popo, and she wants to hold my hand, and I inquire of her, why are you crying? Was it a bad dream, a, a nightmare? She says yes, and I, and I ask her more. Um, is it a, a robot, a stormtrooper from Star Wars, or is it a monster? And she says it's a monster, and I inquire of her, ask her, is it um, a red monster? A green monster? What color is it? Is it blue? And she says, it's purple. It's so vivid in her mind at three years old. It's as if that nightmare has come true. That she wakes up in the middle of night, scared for her life, and then running down the hall to her mom and dad looking for help for job the monster that he had feared had come true and we're not sure what foresight job had into his life but at the very least maybe he had days where he was discouraged as a child and had night terrors and now it has happened how then should we approach this passage of scripture and this morning i want to want us to take a 3000 foot big picture overview of this chapter and by way of introduction to next week's sermon um, i want to ask us why do we need job 3 in our bibles in our lives why do we need job 3 
Firstly, I hope we can see that we need Job 3 because we need to grow in reading God's word. Reading the scriptures and embracing it all, even these difficult parts here in Job. Right, we have to understand that this is written for us in a kind of literature, a genre that is really of uh, wisdom and poetry. So if we consider English literature in the same way, we should also consider the biblical text that we read in that same way. Right? There's a difference between Job and, the, and say, you know, 2 Corinthians. Because here, the story begins and it ends with what is called a narrative frame, as one English professor said. Right? The, the author tells the story of the fall and restoration of our protagonist, our main character, Job. Right? And within these bookends of the fall and the restoration of Job, there unfolds the drama. And it unfolds for us in, in chapter 3 here by way of poetry, right? These, this, this speech, it's quite long and poetic. It is a form of oratory. And what we discover in Job, we need to understand that the kind of literature that it is is that it has these features of a literary tragedy, a story of exceptional calamity, the spectacle of extraordinary suffering, and an exalted hero who undergoes a great fall from prosperity. And so on. And the book resembles for us what could be known as a problem play. Because there is a problem that is posed, that we wrestle with as readers of this historical account. It's not a fictional story. It is a true historical account. Why does Job suffer? Why do the righteous suffer? And we need to uh, grow in embracing all of God's word, even the difficult, hard-to-accept parts Because these words are spoken from God by the Holy Spirit, right? Even as we may not know uh, exactly who the human author is, biblical history tells us, uh, the New Testament development, the development of the Bible tells us that the churches have agreed that this book belongs in the Holy Bible, we think of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so, these people writing, they're not writing just from a human perspective, but they're writing with the Spirit of God who speaks through them, by which the whole church agrees that this is the Word of God. And there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we are reminded that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Verse 16. It is inspired by God and profitable. Right? What does that mean? It means that if you could imagine a cold winter day in Northern California, maybe... Mm, maybe not in the Bay Area, maybe you could think of like north, the northern California and, and further up the elevation and around Tahoe. And if, if I could go back to Tahoe now, that'd be great. But during those winter months, you could just breathe out. You could see the snow flurries fall and breathe out and see the steam coming out of your mouth. This is, in essence, what we have here, all scripture all of the Old Testament for Paul, and all of the whole Bible for us, all Scripture is breathed out by God, and out comes this product of himself, of all that he is and his character, the Scriptures. And they are profitable for us, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, 
and oh, do I desire to be trained in righteousness because I, I, I could so easily speak from my own mouth and from my own flesh, nothing good comes out. I need to be trained in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.17 And if you desire to be equipped for every good work, if you desire that you would be full and complete as a child of God, not lacking anything, then you and I, we need to embrace, to accept all of God's word, even Job chapter 3. I don't know if you're familiar with Jeremiah, but at the very least, you could remember that this weeping prophet, Jeremiah. You know, he, he, he prophesied over the people of God and over their uh, idolatry for offering child sacrifices. And there in Job chapter 19, Jeremiah is proclaiming God's judgment against them and smashing their idols. And then in chapter 20, he is forced to spend the night in jail incarcerated. And when he is alone in his prison cell, the prophet is downcast. It is his dark night of the soul. And he somehow appears to be reciting Job chapter 3 because he is in such torment and discouragement that he regrets ever agreeing to serve the Lord in ministry. And he's depressed. He is cursing the day of his birth in such a similar way as in Job chapter 3. What passage did Jeremiah memorize and recite to get him through those valleys? He used Job 3. Maybe not the most encouraging verse, but surely for such a man known to us as the weeping prophet, it was something that helped him get through it. And so we need to grow in reading God's word, embracing it all. We need to learn something from Job. And one thing I think we ought to learn is simply to genuinely lament, genuinely lament and lament well. We need to be mindful, to be very gentle and careful with the sufferings of others, especially other believers, even if we have not experienced this the same darkness that they are going through. We should be not judgmental upon a person like Job who has failed miserably in responding well to his calamity. And what we'll examine more deeply next week, but I hope we can recognize right now is that Job was a man of Israel who frequently used God's word. His, his, he used God's covenant name and worshipped him. And it shows us that even, even Christians, even true Israelites can experience suffering and hardship under the sovereignty of God. Yes. Even Christians get leprosy. Even followers of Jesus can get COVID-19. And the question that arises out of Job 3 that I hope we can spend this week and next week to examine is the nature of our human response before a sovereign and holy God. How the Christian should respond to suffering and what that simply means is that we should learn to lament. Maybe that makes some of us Men and women a little bit uncomfortable to lament and lament well. What we find that it is inscripturated, this lament, and referred to explicitly by Jeremiah. Job is expressing his grief and sorrow. When was the last time, brother, you expressed your emotions with words with words to God, with words to to your spouse. Notice here that Job, he is expressing his grief and sorrow, which 
means he is no longer passively repressing his feelings, nor is he actively suppressing his tears. He is actively expressing with words his emotions before his God, even if not express, expressly to his God. This is something we ought to learn, brothers and sisters. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, Job used unwise and foolish expressions. But any of us might have used far worse words if we had been in his case. So we will not condemn him. I, I, I kind of wish, you know, may, maybe this is just me from my personal readings over the years of Job, but I kind of wish in the midst of chapter 3 that God would just whoosh and fly in, kind of like Superman, faster than a speeding bullet, and God would arrive on the scene and stop Job from just cursing his whole birth. But Job does not see that happen. God does not just show up out of nowhere here and land in the room right before Job and reprimand him. And so it seems to me that we need to take heed of this word of lament and learn from it. Christians, it's been said, uh, don't celebrate that well. I heard this from a New Testament professor this week for a class I took online, and he heard it from another pastor who said, you know, Christians don't celebrate that well, nor do Christians lament that well. It seems that the only thing we do well is be complacent. And that really cut to my heart, because from reading Job 3, my prayer is that we each would grow in lamenting. And now, this last point. I hope that Job's lament could show us a way to passionately worship God and him alone. Like Job did at the beginning of, of chapter 1, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. But what lament does for us in terms of worship, the theology of worship here in lament, is that it allows us to unmask the, the idols of our hearts, it unmasks the little gods that we have clung onto so dearly with our tight grips. What lament does for Job is allow us to see who he is truly worshiping in his flesh in that moment. It's not, not good, of course. And so the question for us is, are you passionately worshiping God and Him alone? Or are you worshiping something else? Because the things that we hold on to so dearly, the things that frustrate us, that make us mad, that we really get offended when people tell us to do it this way, that tells us what those idols are in our hearts. For Job, what did he lose? We can look back. Job chapter 1. He had seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. Job had so much. He was a godly man. It was noted in Job chapter 1. I don't know if you remember this, but he is known as a blameless and upright man, right? When God speaks to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from, from evil. And so even such a man has little idols in his hearts that as a true Israelite that need to be unmasked, what are some of those idols of my heart? What has been unmasked by this pandemic? I'm just going to speak for myself, okay? 
I've had the idolatry of events. An in-person worship, music, worship and fellowship in the building without mask. I've discovered that I have a, a, a little idol of, of eating out indoors without mass with my family and seeing friends out there. I've discovered that <laughs> this, this, this pandemic has unmasked the, the idol of my heart about mass, right? Because I get uh, a, a so-and-so a little bit frustrated when... I don't see everybody wear a mask when I have to go out, right? I've discovered that even in my heart, reopening or not reopening school, it is a little G God that I have strong feelings about. I need to be really careful about these sections of my heart. I think about um, this recent statement that came out from a big church um, about keeping the, um, the doors of their church open. And they wrote a biblical case for the church's duty to remain open. And it said so much that I agreed with about the doctrine of the church, about how we need to be um, taking a stance when the government and the state, and the, they, they impinge upon us, the church, their laws, which sometimes may be inordinate and inappropriate, and I can see that myself, I have this little idol in my heart. I hold some of these things really strongly. And when the emotions come out, it shows up what are those little gods. And to think of even the, the recent movement in our country around racial injustice, it seems that you could say that there is an idol even in America and California, that there is no systemic racism or institutionalized inequities upon people of color, especially blacks. I could go on, but I think you get the picture and you could discern somewhat what are those idols in your hearts. What Job 3 does for us is that it helps us to begin to realign our perspectives to a divine perspective so that we might hold loosely these things in our hands so that we could hold on to God all the more tightly with our grips. And what will soon happen to our hearts is that we will soon realize that God, it was him who held on to us so tightly when we were in those valleys. And those idols, they don't mean much in comparison to the trust and the hope and the grip that we should have upon our God. Recently, I've been going through a, a bunch of webinars from different church leaders, and uh, in, in one webinar, I was encouraged by the pastor that when I go through uh, criticism, I, I need to be mindful of about how I deal with it. And surely criticism comes even more these days when, you know, the preachers are all on the internet. And the, the, the pastor there in the webinar commended us that there is only really two ways of dealing with criticism. And I think it has application to the way we deal with loss. He said that I could either rehearse it or I could release it. I could rehearse it over and over again and that becomes an unhelpful cycle for my heart because it brings about discouragement and depression. Or, or I could release it to God. Release it to God and to allow Him to, to let Him take it all. To bring it to His throne of grace and let Him have it all. To not listen to Criticism from people I would not otherwise listen to for wisdom, for spiritual encouragement. And I wonder if we need to do that with our sufferings and with our losses. We could indeed rehearse it or we could release it. We could repress it or suppress our feelings or we can express it 
to one another, to our God. I wonder what do you want most during this pandemic? Maybe for a lot of us, and I know this is for me, it is to be comforted, to be assured. And I wish that we would have had a national day of lament already. A national day of lament for the 160,000 American lives and more that are lost to COVID-19. And um, in, in the LA Times, there's a coronavirus obituary that might be helpful to allow us to lament real people with real names and real lives that have died. Might we also have a, a day to lament the lives that have been lost to police shootings, police brutality. And there are almost 1,000 cases in the last year of lives lost to a police officer in a shooting. And there's been a disproportionate number, right, as recorded by the Washington Post. They've been recording this disproportionate number of black lives that are lost to police shootings in comparison to other ethnicities, be it Asians or whites. We need to lament. We need to turn those laments, of course, to the worship of our true and living God, but we need to pause and lament, lament well. This last week, this was unexpected. The explosions in Beirut, it was said to be accidental so far. And over 100 lives that have been lost because of that explosion and the humanitarian crisis that is happening there now. Might we lament? I've even heard of local churches that are part of the Christian church networks that I've been part of. They have been directly affected. They've lost their, their building and their ability to do online church. And just in closing, as we prepare our hearts for the continuation of this chapter next week, in closing, I, I hope that we can grasp from even Job chapter 3 that peace comes through trusting God. We're not told exactly why Job has to experience his suffering. Ever since I was a little boy with that blue hardback NIV, I've tried to figure it out, and I still don't understand why. But I've discovered that that is the very point. Peace comes not by understanding, but by trusting in the living God. Our living God is compassionate. He gave us his son who experienced the darkest of darkness. And in that place, he said, let your will be done, Father. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Let's pray together and go before our God. Ask him to help us this week. Father God, thank you for this message. It definitely has really ruffled my feathers. It is a hard passage to swallow. But teach us this week in preparation for another sermon. Teach us to trust in you even when we don't understand it. Even when we don't see your hand at work. Help us to turn our hearts to you in worship, in lament, trusting and embracing your word for what it really is, which is the word of God spoken by you. Help us to learn this week to lament well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close in one last song together. <laughs>